Hello, hello, everybody. Come on into the living room. This is Heber Brown the third. I'm great to, I'm excited rather to be with you on this Sunday evening, Sunday, June the 7th at 6 p.m. Uh, do me a favor as you're coming on in, go ahead and share this link with everybody in your circle, everybody in your circle of influence. We want Lottie Dottie and everybody to come on and hang out with us for this evening because. One of my favorite human beings on planet Earth <laughs> is hanging out with us tonight and has been so gracious just to give us a few minutes of time. And there's so many of you who are um, have new interests with respect to uh, agriculture and farming as part of the Black Freedom Struggle. If the Black Church Food Networks, Black Church Food Security Networks experiences anything like some of our other comrades and sister organizations, a whole lot of y'all are emailing, donating, reaching out. I appreciate it. And I need to let you know that even as you are coming close to this universe with respect to agriculture as resistance and the black freedom struggle, that there are certain people in this, in this, um, in this orb that you just have to know. You have to know, don't, don't go around saying, that you are knowledgeable or you're passionate about uh, black farming and justice and, and strivings for justice. Uh, and you don't know Dr. Monica White, like don't do it. I'm trying to save you because you will get a whole lot of aid if you walk around and you don't know Dr. Monica White. And so I'm gonna introduce her in a moment, but listen, go ahead, share this. Wherever you are watching, you're on multiple platforms, uh, YouTube, Periscope, Facebook, wherever you are, uh, share this and let us know where you are watching from. We just like to know where people are in the world as we have these conversations. Um, I'm so very grateful she's not on the screen, but she is my uh, rider when it comes to this work. Uh, Deputy Director of the Black Church Food Security Network, none other than Sister Siobhan Terrell, amazing sister, and I'm just so grateful. Uh, we mentor each other, I think. She teaches me so much, and I try to sprinkle a little something, something uh, mm -hmm. what I've learned uh, with her as well. So thank you, Siobhan. Siobhan is uh, working the back room, y'all. So as your questions come in, Siobhan will put them up on the screen or she'll make sure that we see them. I want to make sure that you uh, know that we are having a dialogue and conversation. We want you to be a part of it. Now, y'all. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you people in the world make me giddy and make me start just chuckling like a middle school boy. Uh, this, this woman right here who we're about to have this conversation with is one of the people who just had me blushing and chuckling, holding my face about to cry every few minutes. Uh, she's such a blessing. And uh, I just want to give you a little bio that you can find on her website, monicamariewhite.com. Uh, Dr. Monica White teaches courses in environmental justice, urban agriculture, and community food systems at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's the first African-American woman to earn tenure in both the College of Agricultural Life Sciences and the Gaylord Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. Her research investigates Black, Latinx, and Indigenous grassroots organizations engaged in the development of sustainable community food systems as a strategy to respond to issues of hunger and food inaccessibility. She has presented widely on these subjects from the University of Western Cape in South Africa to UC Berkeley, to the Detroit Public Library, to a little bit of everywhere. She crisscrossed the country before Rona. Uh, and so, so many of y'all have been blessed by her presentations and lectures. She's also the author of this dynamic book <laughs> we're gonna dive into. Freedom Farmers, Agricultural Resistance, and the Black Freedom Movement that came out January of 2019. Please, y'all, help me welcome one of my mentors, teachers, and favorite human beings, Dr. White. We need like uh, applause sound effects on stream, y'all, just to let everybody know. Dr. Monica White, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you. I appreciate you so. You got me giggling and chuckling and tearing up and everything all at once. I appreciate you so. I really do. Oh, thank you, thank you, and uh, so yeah, let's let's dive in. I just appreciate just the time and and 
the ways that you bless my life off camera and away from the crowd, I am I'm actively thinking about how am I going to bless your life? How, what what can I do to repay you for all that you are doing for me on a personal level, uh, and now even um, on an organizational level, you're helping us to grow. And even with Siobhan dropping some stuff, you need to know this person, that person. Like you are amazing, and so thank you for being. Thank you. The blessing you give is by sharing the blessing, right? It's it's what you're doing. It's doing the work and the transition and transformation that you're doing is an example and the example that that sets for other churches um, in our other spirit, you know, um, uh, other religious institutions within our community, especially like we really need all hands on deck at this point. And so the model that you offer, the example that you uh, that you present for us is, is beautiful. And that is, is gra gratitude enough. That's it right there. Thank you. Oh, you are kind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, starting out just about you. You know, we read bios, we see snippets in media and everything else. But I am curious about you and how you got to where you are. So can you, if you don't mind, share a little bit about your personal journey, your academic journey. I got a hunch that there's some um, some newer, younger, just kind of getting out of high school, maybe uh, Dr. Monica White, who might try to take the path that you take. They want to be you. I want to be you. I know they want to be you. Can you share a little bit about your story? Yeah, just too much. So, yes, thank you. Um, I think a lot of who I am and how I see the world comes from being raised in Detroit. Um, there was a real Black consciousness that was a part of my development and um, just was able to see, um, especially through the work of my, my family, um, that there has to be a connection and a commitment to community. And so my father, PhD uh, in educational psychology, my mother was an, um, has a master's degree and she's an educator. But at the same time, like they were doing this work, my dad refused to let, he would not, he was like, you are not going to private schools. You're not, I mean, you know, so he wanted to make sure that we were fully thoroughly integrated into the community. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I was growing up, I, we would spend our summers in the South. Um, my mother's from um, uh, Eden, North Carolina. My father's from Mobile. And so you would either have a little bit of city in the South or a little bit of rural in the South. And I was always the one, if the pickup truck was going somewhere I wanted to go, I didn't care if it was to the junkyard, I didn't care, right? And so one of the things that I just, I was um, in, in spending the time in the South and with my dad, it was always, um, you know, I was always hanging out with people who love the land. And so we were always growing food. My dad always grew food um, in Detroit. My grandmother had a container garden. She was in a wheelchair, but we had a container garden in her living room. And when you went to go see her, she would say, baby, go water grandma's tomatoes. So her logic was if you can grow it inside and outside in dirt, you can grow it inside in dirt. And so we just sort of saw her own agency and her own resilience as an example of growing her own food. Um, and so I just you know, just was fascinated by these questions of people who grew food. And then when I went off to college and I realized that the food options that existed in college towns for broke, broke college students were better than the food options that were available for middle class black folks in Detroit. Wow. And so it was always one of those things. You just kind of ask the question, well, I wonder why that is. Right. Um, and so um, lots of trajectories. When I was writing my dissertation, I was writing on the autobiographies of former Black Panther members. And one of the conversations that I saw really surfacing, um, both in um, Now Ancestor Winnie Mandela's book, but also in Asada Shakur's book, was that this garden was a place of organizing, right? Um, a Now Ancestor, um, when, many, many, Winnie Mandela said that, you know, Everywhere you went, when you know, folks assume you were talking about anti apartheid, but when you were on the land, when you were in the garden, they didn't think that you were organizing, and that then became the space for them to really sort of have conversations openly and freely. And so I'm like, wow, okay. And so I had a chance to go back to Detroit to care for my parents and needed a research topic. And I knew that the language of those who were growing food in Detroit as a part of this urban ag movement didn't look like me, they were not generational Detroiters, they were not. Uh, black folks, they were not folks who grew in the variety of ways that we grew. And so I knew that our voices were missing in that conversation. So um, doing some work on the uh, 67 Rebellion Conference to recognize uh, the 67 Rebellion, uh, Baba Malik Yakini and I were organizing for the conference. And then I found out about the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network and Baba Malik changed my life and gave me a chance to find my passion and my calling in this work. And so I'm in, uh, entirely, eternally indebted to him and the founders of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it was just sort of, 
I, I was given the question when I was working on my dissertation, not just to pay attention to what's there, what voices are there, what voices we hear and the people we see, but also ask the questions, who are the people that we don't see? And it was in that quest to uncover and unearth the voices. I knew for a fact that most of the scholarship that talked about black folks in the land talked about sharecropping, tenant farming and slavery. I knew that that was not the only connection to the land because every time there's an economic downturn, black folks turn back to growing food. So it just mm. didn't make sense that our only story was shaped from a deficit model. And so hearing the work of the folks at the DBCFSN and hearing the passion and their connection to food provision as a strategy of resistance and resilience, I wanted to provide today's Detroit with an example that came from other moments, other historical moments when black folks use food as a strategy toward freedom. Mm. Oh, so rich, so rich. And and uh, so we're gonna dive into this dynamic book in a second, <clears throat> but I just gotta shout out Baba Malik as well. Um, as you were talking about, and it's so beautiful, talking about your grandmother, your parents, and, and like weaving it all together, talking about Baba, Baba Malik, it made me think about this dynamic um, uh, family tree that we're on. Like, I, I can see it. I can see this tree that we too at the Black Church Food Security Network have to point to Baba Malik because yeah. it's right in the name. I mean, it was Baba Malik <laughs> and the Detroit uh, Black Community Food Security Network that inspired me, blew my mind. I'm like, whoa. And so I was like, how can yeah. we take the, 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 the spirit of that? Yeah. Planted in the soil of the church. I want to be Baba Malik, but like in a in a Sunday morning tie in yeah. front of a black Baptist church. So and hearing, even hearing about the Black Church Food Security Network, the first time I heard it, I was like, brilliant. It's brilliant because I don't think that the church has given a place and a space in the movement. So what you're doing is transformational in that you're bridging the conversation like you did at Bugs last year. You're bridging the conversation between folks who would think we don't have anything to talk about and really helping us realize that we're in this together. So I'm really grateful for your work and was always, my mind was always blown and just having a chance to see you when I came to Baltimore was just, that was just the icing on the cake. Oh, you made my day and you still make my life. So I appreciate that. Um, you, you first hit my radar though, when I read your article, A Pig in the Garden, Fannie Lou Hamer and the Freedom Farms Cooperative. Um, I heard, heard people talking about you and your name here and there, but when that article hit and I read that, I was like, oh, snap. You know, for one, for one and this is not in, in, in the question per se, but I really appreciate how you write. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the fact that your writing for me feels very conversational. Right. And I'm not saying that in such a way to say that it's not intellectual. It's deeply intellectual, but it's like a it's a converse. It's a conversive. It's a close, familiar intellectual that pulls me in without making me feel intimidated by the knowledge where I'm like, no, nah, never mind. That ain't for me. So reading your article um, and, and I know that genius just comes from you. But I just want I want to name that that you had that gift. Thank you, but let me tell you, let me tell you that that, thank you. I appreciate that. I, mm -hmm. I fought for that. Um, I fought mm -hmm. for it because in my very first class in graduate school, um, I was um, in the PhD program at Western Michigan University in sociology. And the very first class I took was the theory course. So I went into the class and everybody's using all, I mean, I know for a fact they were making up words. Like I know for a fact they were making up words. I was like, right, so I was like, that's not a word. That is not a word. So I remembered how I felt in that moment. And I went home and I called my dad, who was a professor at Wayne State at the, at the time. And I was like, dad, this ain't for me. This is not for me. Like they're using language I don't understand. I don't know what's going on. What do I do? Do I drop out? He was like, nope, you're not going to drop out. You're going to. And so what I realized to me was that the academy was trying to force me to use a language that was further um, distancing me from the people that I feel I was called to serve. Right. And so I have always had to dance between. I feel like I had to work double, uh, you know, twice as hard because I had to read their work. I had to understand their language, but I also had to translate that language into a right, you know, so that it'd be useful for us. And I even had to fight against, you know, it, it's part of the publication process. That wasn't easy, you know, trying to show people that there was value and merit in this work and the language that I use. And so for me, I had a particular audience and that audience was 
you know, people like you. I wanted folks to be able to read it, to not need a sociology dictionary while they were sitting. I want you to hear the stories of your own history so that you begin to see yourself as a part of this legacy and figure out where you belong as you pass your, right? You know, we receive a legacy and we pass on, um, you know, those gifts, those blessings. And so I just wanted to make sure that mm -hmm. we have the language and we were able to understand it uh, without making it um, inaccessible. That was really important to me. Mm. Well, well, I appreciate it. And I think uh, I would imagine there might be some other PhD students or aspirants to the PhD track um, who would be very encouraged by your example of pushing back and saying, you know, I am I'm, I'm writing for my folk because reality is, I mean, like you said, it it's so easy to become distanced from whether you're talking about the academy, whether you're talking about pastoring in the church, like those those currents can take you what they call it a riptide. When the current pool is right deep into the ocean before you know it, you're far away from shore. That's the word. Yeah, those currents can pull you so fast. That's right. That's right. And then you come back home and nobody recognizes you and nobody, you don't feel familiar. And you know, uh, that's some math. That's, I didn't, that's not even on my little paper. Go ahead, Doc. I mean, but that's true, right? I mean, to me, that's that's the problem of the academy. The academy doesn't teach us. Often we come in with these, you know, with smarts and experiences and the university often doesn't give us the kind of uh, acknowledgement that there are solutions in our communities and our people are solutionaries. And we often sent out in saying, I mean, just to give you an example, when you're writing a research proposal or um, you're writing a master's thesis or any kind of a proposal, they usually say, what is the statement of the problem? Mm -hmm. Well, think about if I'm going out looking for problems, Right. So right. it automatically assumes a deficit approach, especially when it comes to our community. And just let me just say, if you come in my house and you say, oh, OK, well, this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. <laughs> How that gonna make me feel right. I'm going to quickly tell you that. Right. But if I come in and I say every community has something upon which to build. So when you take an asset approach, it's very different than a deficit approach. And I promise you, I feel better. So it was to me, how do I just challenge the language, but also the approach? Because I don't want anybody to say, I talked to Monica and I feel horrible. I don't mm. want anybody to say that the view of our communities is anything other than something that's uplift, uplifting and um, um, showing us that we all have a part to play in, in, in our resistance and saving our own lives. And so for me, it was very intentional, even though I didn't have any. I felt like there wasn't very much support from the academy, but I, I fought it. I demanded and wanted to make sure that folks knew that you didn't have to give up your soul and your blackness just to fit into uh, somebody else's description of who we're supposed to be. Good Lord, you are preaching on this Sunday. <laughs> I'm going to go to the church in a minute. This is good. Uh, hey, hey, folks, listen, if you got a question for Dr. Monica White, please type that in. I knew the time was going to go fast and it is zooming on us. And so please type your questions. Yeah, it's zooming. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to give it straight to this dynamic book. And I just want to make sure everybody look at this. <laughs> If you are serious about learning about this work and the history and the heritage here, you have to get this book. Thank if you me. are in this space and you don't have this book, I'm going to tell you now, I'm going to judge you. I'm going to judge you. I'm going to tell you. You need it. Freedom from <laughs> Culture Resistance in the Black Community by Dr. Monica White. Like and Doc, just while I'm doing the commercial for the book, uh, is there a preferred place where you want people to get the book? Is there or anywhere? Yes. Yes, please. I would love it if we support black booksellers, um, community booksellers, um, small booksellers. Uh, there are several that um, are offering free shipping. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, that would be my preference to, to support the small booksellers. Awesome. Awesome. So, folks, please get the book today. Get it today from a small bookseller. There's a number of them. In fact, if you just Google like community bookstores or local bookstores, Especially you can black. <laughs> right. hey, I'm sorry, you're right. Black, 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 black. Please and thank you, Black Lives Matter. Appreciate you. Uh, <laughs> but that, okay, so the, the, the uh, real quick, because a lot of it ended up in the book, the article that I referenced, A right. Pig in the Garden. Yeah. But one of the things that I wanted to ask you about that, you know, I grew up studying, I grew up being introduced to Fannie Lou Hamer like so many others, and her whole life gets boiled down to nine words. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Um, 
why do you think there was such um such a uh blindness to yeah. this huge this huge project this huge mission that she gave herself to on the latter end of her earthly sojourn why did why was that ignored do you think yeah so one, I think that women, uh, black women especially, are often overlooked and ignored in movement spaces. And so we don't often give black women the same kind of time and attention that we do um, to um, male identified uh, activists and organizers. So I feel like it was dismissed in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, second, I think that it was because she wasn't quote, formally educated. And mm -hmm. so I do recognize that there's some, there some intellectual uh, elitism that um, people, weren't able that did not pay attention to um, um, folks who were, do not have the you know various kinds of credentials and, and pedigree. So it was hard for some for, for some folks to see her brilliance. Um, I think another example is so much of the civil rights history happens in cities, and not a lot happens in rural spaces. And so there's a privilege on that end. And I think the last thing is that farmers, and I use that definition loosely. Um, I don't feel like we've understood and interrogated the role of farmers in the Black Freedom Movement. And so for me, what was important was for to me to make the connection between if I can provide myself, if I, uh, as Reverend Paris says, you can free yourself when you can feed yourself. And so for me, like I, that blew my mind when he said that. And I was sitting here thinking like being able to control my own food then allows me a whole lot of political options that would not be available otherwise. If I am totally beholden to you for all of my everything, which is how the South was and sharecropping and tenant farming relationships. And that was really what we left. We didn't leave the work of the farm. We left the exploitation and the oppression and moved to the exploitation and the oppression that happened in, in urban areas, Northern areas and the automobile industry. But I do think that farmers are often overlooked and ignored um, and I think that um, what Mrs. Hamer illustrates for us is there's so much organizing that happens behind the scenes. We would not have this current moment if it hadn't been folks on the ground for years working and organizing and educating and talking and meeting. And like what we are in the midst of right now could not happen had it not been for the organizing that we don't see. So just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. And it takes those of us with our ears to the ground. Like if you're listening to the treetops, you're going to miss it. You got to listen to the rumble of the elf elephants, right? By putting your ear to the soil. Then you're like, oh, y'all, something's coming. Something is about to go down. And so therefore we, you know, and so I just think that there are lots of folks who um, were quick and easy to sort of, um, to, uh, to, to minimize her contribution uh, without really sort of understanding the, the depth and the breadth of what she offered us. And I do think that this gives us an example to think about what do we mean by success, right? Mm -hmm. For social movements, people often say a, a movement has to be successful if they accomplish everything. Well, I would argue differently, right? There's some who say the Black Panthers weren't successful because they didn't overthrow the government. Well, before the Panthers, we didn't have school breakfast programs, community health centers. We didn't have, it's a bunch of things that they were, that were, that are now a part of who we are that came from them. And so I think that both as academics, intellectuals who study these conversations, but also those of us who are on the ground doing the work, I feel like we have to think differently about what success looks like. So I think if people can dismiss her um, if you are not paying attention to why what she did was so profound. Mm, that's helpful, that's, that's helpful. And so you unpack so much more of her journey and story in the book, mm -hmm. along with um, others as well. I mean, you did. I love your treatment of Booker T. Washington. I got to tell you that we've had a very uh, me and our great ancestor, Booker T. Washington, have had a strained Ooh. relationship over the years. Where's my tambourine? <laughs> <laughs> Lord, oh, boy. And the way you treated Booker T. Washington in this text, I had never, and this ain't, I ain't trying to gas you up, I promise you, I never heard, read, seen someone lift and raise the real tension, lay it out there, right? And, and you, didn't, you didn't cast the judgment to, to condemn him. You pointed to the context, you pointed to how he was maybe trying to think about it, you, you put it out there and you left it. I just appreciate how you did that. I, I don't know. I, you don't even know. Like, darn, no. Like, just a couple. It's just a few people on the planet knew. <laughs> Me and Baba Book, we was like duking. Like, he was saying, okay, so first, let me tell you, this is what happened. So first I said, I knew what I thought I knew about him. 
And right. so what I did was I wanted to be fair. And I said, let me just kind of be raised. Let me just, let me, with new fresh eyes, let me look at who he was and what he said and understand what he did within the context of his time. So that was, that in and of itself is hard. Cause you've grown up thinking, you know, and you already think, okay, well, we wouldn't be homies. So then once I was reading some of the stuff that I, I, I feel like we, people are complex and nobody would want to be recognized for a school, an argument, and right. I mean, you know, just just the thinking about how we reduce him, I think is a disservice to understand the complexity of who we are. So, and it wasn't easy. And I knew I had to explain why, uh, why we struggle, right? Uh, but also lift up his accomplishments, his contributions, his school is still there, still educating black folks, still doing the do, right? And so how do we then honor who he was within that context? And also say he has said some hurtful things about farmers without pushing against the structural forces that cause us to not have access to education, not have access to certain kinds of resources. So he was willing to say, okay, well, these lazy farmers. And I'm like, first of all, I don't know how you could say lazy farmer, right? That to me, the combination, you ever hang with a farmer, you know, as no such thing as lazy but then also understanding and recognizing their brilliance as it may not be defined within the context of a, a traditional academic you ask a farmer they can do complex mathematical computation right johnny on the spot look at a bag of seeds and tell you how many acres how much they'll get what is the profit i mean up and down so i just really wanted to be fair and still say that yes he still made me mad <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> it just wasn't right. I mean, let's be clear. Yeah. But how can we also say he did some things that, like, you know, how can we just not put a person in a category, but yet understand and unpack what that means? And, and I think what you share there is 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 so important and has such interplay with our current time, right? Cancel culture is real today, right? You it, you'll be dismissed and condemned and banished to the island. Um, and if, if you let that vine grow too fast and too far, it'll strangle you too. Because I mean, I would imagine for many of us, you dig too deep, you're gonna find some kind of contradiction. I'm gonna admit mine, I got contradictions all up and through here. Um, but the way that you honored the complexity and said, who wants to be reduced down to an Atlanta compromise to, you know what I mean? It's like, that is very helpful. In an argument, a school in an argument. Like, no, I mean, a speech, a school in an argument. I feel like none of us would want to be known for three things. No. Show the complexity of who I am and those tensions. You can also critique me. I'm, I'm open for that too. So mm -hmm. yeah, I just tried to give the brother a break, but it was not easy. I mean, we, <laughs> Let me talk about another brother you write about who I admit before I got to your book, I hadn't heard a whole lot of his intellect connected to agriculture. And that's W.E.B. Du Bois and the way that you gave room to how he connects into the intellectual tradition related to agriculture was very powerful. Can you just say a word about that? Sure. So the major, most of what we know about Du Bois is about the talented tent. But that was really a small portion of his whole life. Literally, he said his work on co-ops was what he wanted to be known for. So mm -hmm. thanks to the work of Dr. Jessica Nimhart, who just, I mean, if you aren't, if you don't have collective courage, I'm a question. I'm, I'm a right, I'm a question your <laughs> right? Just because I think she gives us such a beautiful way to understand the history of economic um uh cooperativism as a strategy of resistance and like how do we get free is using this you know using this, this as a technique so um what i love about du bois was that he looked at segregation and said okay so given here's the state of segregation it wasn't that he was not interested in working in segregation but he was he was said since we're in a state of segregation how might we use this to come out stronger and so he's saying if we don't go to white shops if we don't do you know white owned entities how then might we be able to come out using segregation as an opportunity for us to be collaborative, cooperative, and to build? How then do and, and so he literally maps out what we would call a systems analysis, and probably one of the first examples of a systems analysis. He's like, black, you know, uh, food producers are connected to black artisans, are connected to black artists, are connected to black schools, are connected to you know black uh, hospitals, and just really thinking about this as a systems approach and realizing 
emphasizing that food production is a part of that. And so I just was so grateful for his ability to tell us that, yes, segregation is a horrible thing and we're always gonna work against that, but also how do we come out of this in a way that creates community health and wellness? That's, that's, that's amazing. And, and as you unpack Du Bois's uh, thoughts around that collectivism, it makes me think, again, think about this moment, right? You have thousands, hundreds of thousands of people marching in streets, and there's a significant percentage of them saying, okay, what next? Where do we go from here? You know, you see, you, we both are seeing some of the posts that are being made about, here's a list of black businesses, here's the black restaurants, here's this, and here you have in Du Bois and so many others, but in this moment, Du Bois, who says, hey, I've, I've thought through this stuff and it can be helpful in terms of trying to understand where might we consider going next yeah. in this particular moment. So here's what I'm going to, here's my recommendation. Okay. I understand that we are, un, that as a black community, we're under attack from a lot of different angles, right? Folks who are concerned about education, folks are concerned about food, folks are concerned about healthcare, folks are concerned about transportation, folks are concerned about housing. We often end up fighting these as individual struggles. What might we do if we understood them as collective struggles and then were able to pull our resources together to respond to that? You and I know Sister Dara Cooper, know and love uh, Dara, who always tells me that individually we are vulnerable. Collectively, we have strength. Say so, that, Dara. Right, right, right. <laughs> so uh, I'm always thinking, like, individually, an individual farmer, you know, one bad crop. But Mr. Burkett tells us that the reason that he still has that land in his family is because of the cooperative. And so I absolutely believe that um, mutual aid is a critical is is coming is a critical idea uh, that is necess necessitated uh, by in this moment. Um, cooperatives, be they formal cooperatives and collectives or informal, I, I just you know I, I just want to emphasize that these struggles are connected, right? So those of us that are interested in food are also interested and in, concerned about land, interested in the environment, interested. And so all of these things, if we cast, if we have the wide a wide enough uh, umbrella that we can fit everybody under, then we don't have to feel like we're losing our minds by chasing all these individual struggles and recognizing how they're connected. Because if you think about who's in control of food access and you think about that in addition to some of these other, like they end up being similar, um, uh, similar, similar folks on the opposing side. Yeah, I, I spent a lot of my 20s running to every rally and every protest. I can, my blood pressure going crazy. I'm worn out, stressed out. And, you know, what you just said, I almost wish I could get in the time machine and go back and talk to 21 year old Heber and say, bruh, breathe, number one, two, you're not a Superman. Find your folk, get your tribe, and sit down and think about this more collectively. That's, That's very powerful. Thank you. As we as we dig into that, I think it, it connects here in a very uh, a good great way as well. You introduce this theoretical framework in the book, collective agency and community resilience, and it kind of dovetails very good, very well off of what you just shared. Tell us, I mean, this is a baby you named in the world and, and blessed us with. Tell us what, what what is this theoretical framework? What is it? So um, collective agency and community resilience. First, I was a social psych major as, um, uh, as an undergrad, uh, sociology and psychology. And I really didn't feel like one was a good enough way. Like I, I wanted to make sure that we had room for the psychological, but also for the social, right? And so understanding agency, we think about agency, most of the scholarship is on agency from a psychological perspective. Why did I get involved in a movement? But as we know, those of us that are in movements, ain't no such thing as an I, it's always a we. And so to talk about agency without talking about the collective means that you're missing an important component of how movements happen. The second thing was resilience. I know we are known for being resilient. Catastrophic events have happened in every generation, every decade, there's been every something there's, and so we are resilient and that is incredible. Communities are resilient, but I think it's an irresponsible act. I say that very definitively to talk about the resilience of a people without pushing against the structural forces that cause those communities to be vulnerable to begin with. So you can't say, wow, look at how wonderful we are after we come out of COVID. You also have to say, here are the structural forces that created the catastrophe to begin with, and then how do we organize to make sure that that doesn't happen? So the theoretical framework actually came from combing through 
pages and pages of archival data. Um, there were several, so originally um, the book was supposed to be from 18, uh, <laughs> mid 1880 to 2000. And my friend, uh, dear friend, Sunniyata Chajua, who's at uh, Urbana um, Champaign, he was like, Mo, you gotta get this book out. You'll never finish it if you're trying to cover 100. I was like, okay, okay, okay. So what I did was I, Try. I wanted. So while I only talk about three organizations, I, my theoretical framework is informed by several organizations. If there was an organization that I can find out what they did, I wrote down what they did, and then I categorized those things, those actions, and then identified those as strategies of collective agency and community resilience. So here's where we get commons as praxis. How do we? These co-ops, these organizations that I studied historically talked about how do we make shared decisions about those resources that belong to us. How do we make sure that the water, uh, the, how do we decide about seeds? How do we talk about shared land? That kind of commons as praxis meant not just theoretically, but also in practice. How do we show that this belongs to us and make those collective decisions? Uh, economic autonomy and independence, these organizations try, you know, work really hard to make sure that they were creating multiple streams of income, that they were able to be economically viable and what have you. Some, you know, just talking about um, the B, B, B notes. Is that the B notes? Coming up with your own currency, D-Town dollars, you know, sweat equity. Like, how do we talk about economic autonomy as we also lift, um, uh, lift uh, work toward freedom. And the last was really sort of prefigurative politics. So what was important to me was to talk about while we have been excluded from the political process, many of our organizations would say one person, one vote. That also required that we do things in terms of political education, making sure people have information about what our options are so that we can all make a decision as to which direction to go in. So the prefigurative pre politics happens while we're disconnected from the process outside, our organizations reflect those morals and those values by making sure we implement these decisions um, wholeheartedly and with everyone's con uh, contribution. So those, that's the theoretical framework and the strategies were informed by the black farmers co cooperatives and collectives that I was able to, to observe, uh, to study and to categorize their activities. I, our dear sister in love, Dara Cooper has a question. What is one of your favorite memories while researching for this mm -hmm. book? Oh, it's so many, so many. Here, okay, so here's one. Um, so uh, in researching the book, writing the book, I spent a lot of wonderful time with farmers who just so incredible and thoughtful and answering all of my crazy questions because I didn't want to just know, like I didn't want to just go to the archives and hear, like I really wanted a farmer to read the book and to feel like I was speaking their language, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted historians to feel like that. I wanted you know, students to feel like I wanted everybody to hear it and to like to read it and to hear their own discipline reflected back to them. And so I um, spent a lot of time with farmers. I would spend days in the archives and then at night I call Mr. Burkett and say, Mr. B, meet me at such and such. I have some questions. So it was always in conversation, right? Or I'll call Baba Malik. Baba Malik, okay, well, I see this. Well, tell me how this, where does this fit? Where do we go? So that's why I say that the book is collective because this was produced from community and was intended for community. I think that my favorite memory that still gives me goosebumps, when I was little, going to Eden, North Carolina, uh, where my mom is from, my dad and my, uh, my grandma and my granddad were both farmers. We had lots of land. And what we also had was a store in the front of the house. So in the store, of course, you know, they got candy. My mom would be like, don't give that baby all that candy. And of course, what do good grandparents do? They give you all the candy. But what I didn't know, um, so I had turned in the book, I had responded to the editor and the reviews and all this. And then I had a moment to ask my aunt. I said, Aunt Barbara, tell me about the store that was in the front of the house. And she said, oh baby, they called that the community store. Wow. And I said, wait a minute. She said, yes, Granddaddy Kenneth had, he, uh, with nine other far eight other farmers, they created a cooperative and the store was where they could get their family stuff, their farm implements, they shared a car. Wow. And it wasn't, that's why I got goosebumps, right? It wasn't until after I finished the doggone book to realize that I was writing about my granddaddy. Now I knew he was a farmer, but I didn't know he was a member of a cooperative. I'm a kid, what do I know about co-ops? I didn't know anything about it. So the, that is to me, to find that, um, um, that was my Alice Walker's moment uh, in search of my mother's garden. I found my own. 
Mm. You know, I literally could not, I could not believe, could not believe that I would. So now I need, you know, I'm, I've been doing some digging and found out that my granddaddy inherited land from my great granddaddy. And I'm trying to figure out my own family trajectory, given the story that I thought I had. I didn't think I had a direct connection to until after I had written the book. And so that to me is a testament to following where you're called. Yeah. When you go where you are called, what blessings happen for you. You really are not, you, you're not ready. <laughs> you just ain't ready. You don't even wow. know. You don't even know. What an amazing memory. That, that is, uh, that's beautiful. That, that's beautiful. Um, mm, I'm, I'm curious. We have so many people watching tonight who are in their own right, just inspiring, uh, offering inspiring leadership in so many different ways. Uh, Dr. Howard Conyers is, is in here tonight. Uh, dynamic brother, blessed to meet at Bugs last year. Brilliant, sharp mind. I love the brother. Grateful as well for uh, Pastor Curtis Whitaker, who is in Gary, Indiana. Uh, wonderful church out there. He was. I took some of my members out to meet with him. Our young adults met with him. He got chicken coops, solar panels, farming. He's doing all this great work. Uh, we're going to have him on the program soon because the brother's doing amazing. But you, you for me, are, are very special, just like they are, because you have dug deep into the history. And I believe because of the depth of what you've studied, you have seer qualities and seer characteristics. Because I believe that in so many ways where we have been helps to give shape and inform what's coming next. I don't want to sit with a seer who didn't didn't sit with the griot and didn't read no books. That, you know what I mean? So, with all of these dynamic people who are watching um, and trying to do, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, trying to pivot and 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 all the stuff, I believe that you have an eye on the deeper horizon. And I just want to hear, you know, what do you see that we might want to consider? Um, you've talked about co-ops and mutual aid and the like. Is there anything else that the Howard Conyers, the Heber Browns, the Daras, and so many others that we should be thinking about in this moment? Yeah. So um, one, I, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sociologist. I, I really don't. I, I don't often prognosticate. I, I don't anticipate. You know what I mean? Like I, I just sort of study in the moment. And what I saw, so it's, it's difficult for me to look in the future. Um, yeah. but I, so I, I don't know that I feel comfortable sort of like okay. projecting because I do believe that the folks on the ground doing the work are the best ones to tell us, right? I mean, I think that there are lots of academics who might give you an answer, but I think I defer to those who are doing the work, the Dara Coopers, the Malik Yakinis, the LaDonna Redmond, the Heber Browns. Like, I feel like you all have a real pulse. I'm just, I'm just gonna like give you, I, my, my, um, my superpower has been, I want to, um, I, I wanna give you the things you need so that we can change the world. Like, let me help and let me just, you know, you know do what, I, what role I play in that. So I, I don't know that I have a vision for what we need to do, but I will tell you, that um, the cooperative, the mutual aid, like all the things, all the ways that we can think about being uh, community, the ways that we can build some community self-determination and community self-reliance. And so here's my, you know, I told you originally when I got into a class, I, you know, everybody was making up words. So that's my made up word, which is most of the time we talk about self-determination, self is the most dominant. But when I talk about community self-determination and community self-reliance, I'm talking about making sure that we do this for us together, but also um, being able to uh, uh, to determine where we go from here. And so I, I absolutely uh, believe that it is our work in all forms of the food system, but also connecting our food system work into other justice frames and talking about how they connect and how they uh, can build and making sure that we do what Du Bois told us, which is in the moment of crisis, we need to be thinking about being supportive, providing resources, caring for each other, and figuring out who do we want to be when we come out of the storm. Du Bois said that. He said it. He See, said it. See, so so I, I, I kind of I kind of knew um, that you were going to push back a little bit on Seer. I, something in me is like, nah, I knew that. Right? So I'm ready. 
I, I got my curveball already ready. I said, let me just get this other one over here because she not she gonna bat them down. But what you just did was like see her stuff. So I appreciate that. What <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of people in this moment are studying the um pandemic in the early 1900s. Um are there other moments in history? So let me say it this way. Don't look into the future. Look into the past with me. Are there other moments in history that we might want to dig deeper, you know, beyond a surface level to say, hmm, some of the things that we're experiencing now has some kind of parallel to this moment in history or what Black people experienced in this town, even if it's just in one little community, right? Are there other moments like that where we should study to kind of look through the tea leaves of those moments mm -hmm. Learn well, think, oh, we should always be studying, right? If it's, we should always, like, we should not have, you know, as a child, I was one of those kids who was known to always carry a book. You know, um, I, I'm, I'm all, I'm never without something to read because, and, and, and it has to be to me. I mean, we can do the Twitter, the Snapchat, the TikTok, but that hardwires us to be, should have short attention. We should all be engaged in actually reading. And I, I have a thing. I, I love a book. I, you know, I have a Kindle and I also love a book because I need to turn some pages. I need to dog ear. I need to take some notes. I need to do all those things. Um, but I also think um, that uh, our history is so rich and has been told through other lenses that we need to be the ones to tell our stories. And so there are all kinds of stories and all kinds of people that we have missed, overlooked and ignored because folks wasn't trying to hear it. I mean, I can tell you that when I submitted my book proposal, um, there were folks who did not believe that there was any substance to what I was writing. And that's because they couldn't see me. They couldn't hear what I was saying. And also, I mean, to be brutally honest, I kind of wasn't writing for them. That's because <laughs> Right, you don't see it. I ain't, I ain't even talking to you. I ain't, I ain't even you. talking to you. <laughs> you know, right. <laughs> right. So I absolutely believe that there are several moments, and I think when you look at any economic deep downturn in our society, black folks came together in some way. So post slavery, it was a colored farmers alliance that had um, stations all throughout the South. In the Depression, black folks came together and created. In the '60s, black folks came together and started the Southern Cooperative Movement. And today, like, what will that? What will our children's children talk about? in this moment. And so I think that it's really important for us to um to, to take a different take a Booker T lens to our history. And there's some folks who have incredible stories that we haven't unearthed, right? Booker T. Watley and several folks. And there are also some folks who've been cheated, like Mrs. Hamer, whose stories need to be elevated. Um, and so the thing that I can offer is what was offered to me, my dissertation chair said, when I was reading the autobiographies of former Black Panther members, he said, pay attention to what you see, but what you don't see. And so it was like, you know, what do you mean I don't see? I gotta finish this dissertation. If you don't see it, how is it there? But I didn't realize the gift, the blessing that he was offering me because it was from that moment that I started, I trained myself to ask the question, okay, this is an interesting food policy. Let me see who was at the table. This is an interesting intervention. Let me see whose decision this was. This is interesting. And so what it forced me to do was to pay attention, not only to the voices of those who were the loudest, but also to pay attention to those who have been muted. And I will say this, this. From now on to the end of time, please don't ever, 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 ever say this again. There's no such thing as a voiceless community. Mm. Hey, give voice to the voiceless. You're not. No, don't do it. No, you're not doing that. The people in Flint weren't voiceless. They told us we were we were deaf. We couldn't hear them. And so no academic gives voice to anybody. No you know, leader gives voice to anybody. People are voiced and have agency and we need to recognize and pay attention to that and elevate those voices i want to there's uh a few questions that came in but listen y'all get the book <laughs> buy it buy it from a black bookstore black bookstore go buy it spread, spread the word make this a meme put this on your insta <laughs> get the book <laughs> <laughs> and what you've also done tonight, and I'm feeling it as well, and Siobhan and Dara um, are amening it and saying it too in the comments, is we saying we got to go back and read the book again. <laughs> this is like, go get a biscuit and sop up the rest of this <laughs> that you missed in the book. So I can't wait to go back 
and dig. Um, here's wait a minute. Here's my. Uh, <laughs> in the casket with me, please tell me. <laughs> Listen, y'all. Some people are asking about you know who, what other people can you study and learn about? They're in the book. Check the book. W. E. B. The boys. Check the book. Are there any others who maybe didn't make the book, Doc? That you know yeah. you would. So the answer is yes. Yeah. There are lots of people who didn't make the book, but my focus was on organizations. And the reason my fo well, focus was on organizations is because you can have a leader, you can have leadership. I really wanted to focus on the work that people collectively were doing. So I'm sure that there are lots of folks that I missed and lots of organizations that I missed because, you know, so if anybody has any organizations that you want me to include in my list, I have a running list of the organizations when they started, what they did and categorizing their work in particular kinds of ways. Um, another thing, please make sure that your church is documenting absolutely everything. If you have an organization that's doing any work, make sure, and you don't just have it in one place, not just one computer, not just one basement, make sure you document, 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 because our babies and our babies' babies will need to know what we did, why we did it and what did it mean for us to have done it so i forgot what my question what uh uh what uh what, what organization so right so yeah there are lots of people that can be lifted up in this work and there are lots of organizations that did tremendous work i just wanted to kind of give some examples based on scale and what was really important when i was doing that was you know this is when detroit was going through an economic downturn and um, just really sort of thinking about that was not due to the people, right? That was anyway, that's a whole nother conversation. But what I knew was that I had to understand how it must have felt for someone to be completely beholden to a white landowner in terms of sharecropping and tenant. And then you go to exercise your right to vote. They evict you and they fire you. What must that have felt like in that moment? And then to hear Mrs. Hamer say, that's okay, baby. Come on over here. She said, with well, a pig in a garden, nobody can tell me what to do. And so what must it have felt like to that sharecropper or that tenant farmer who had just been evicted and whose life was threatened for them to say, here's 680 acres, here's a community kitchen, here's a community garden, here's a health center, a mobile health center. I'm like, all of the things, here's education to retrain you from just knowing how to do these cash crops to doing subsistence crops. How do we build a whole community? And so that transformation, like when I sat in that, and sat in that moment, the rest of the book really wrote itself. So there are lots of folks who do incredible work. My book is not the end all be all. So let's build, let's tell these stories, let's write, let's do our own histories. Let's you know share this information and make sure that um, that we have, that we leave a legacy uh, and, and move the ball forward in terms of what freedom looks like. Amazing. My dear sister, my leader, my teacher, my guide, I thank you so much for this time. I really, I really do. You people are already saying in the chat box, they're saying, I just bought the book. I just bought the book. <laughs> <laughs> is there another? Is there another? Somebody else tell me you just bought the book. Oh, absolutely. Okay, good. Thank well, you. Let me also say, let me also say it's a bunch of us that are writing, right? You know, Leah Penman, like, you know, Ashante Reese's book. Like, this is a moment for black women talking about black food and black freedom. And so I really, really don't want you just to stick with freedom farmers. There are so many pieces, like he Williams Forson is out here in these streets. Like, there's some really thoughtful women whose work has often overlooked. Um, and so uh, don't just hang with me, roll with my sisters. <laughs> the whole crew, with the whole crew, that's right. Somebody else just said, I just bought oh, the book. that's so sweet, thank yeah. you. That's very yeah, sweet. It is. This is beautiful. Y'all keep on buying the book. Tell <laughs> all your friends about the book. Start book club with your people around this and all the other texts. So shout out to our dear sister, Leah Pennyman. Just turned 42. Happy birthday, Leah. We love you. Shante Shout out Reese. All the all these books. Listen, for a whole lot of us, we have a little bit more time than perhaps we are accustomed to, some of us anyway. And so these will be great week reads to uh to pick up and just to be very thoughtful in this moment. Very thoughtful in this moment. These books. I, I, I know your book, Doc, has fed my imagination. It didn't just feed my 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 hunger for information, but it instigated and cultivated the soil of my imagination. Mm -hmm. and, I started saying, well, if they could do this, what if I could do that? I mean, listen, your book made me go to 
um, the, the, the home, the street, Fat, Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer, I went to the community That's because right. your book, oh, right. oh, okay, we're going to shut it down. But no, your, okay, well, okay, well, right. So, so, I mean, so like it is about paying that homage, or homage, right? It is about recognizing. And I also think it's important for us to, um, to make sure that we fully integrate all that we learn in a variety of different ways. I want to make sure that folks are sharing in multiple me you know, forms of media, um, you know, the comic books and, you know, just making sure that we get this information in, in, in as many ways as we possibly can. So I'm eternally grateful that this book has meant something to you. And there, that's because of all the people. I wrote the book for two reasons. One, I wanted to uplift the work of hundreds of years of Black labor that has been ignored, right? And the other thing I wanted to do was I wanted to hold up a mirror to all the black folks who are doing this justice work and to see how incredibly beautiful you truly are. And so it is something that I get from you that I give. And it's also an example of our power as a collective and as black people. And I just wanted it to really sort of acknowledge a group of folks that had been ignored for way too long. That That's a benediction if I ever heard one. Thank you <laughs> to my dear, dear, Dear sister, Dr. Monica White, you mean so much to me and so many of us who uh, who sit at your feet, learn and glean from you. And then you don't let us sit there long. You make us get up and go right and go do something and keep on working. That's right. I'm yeah. true. <laughs> on that book. You're real good for that. You, you are real good for that. But thank you so much, y'all. Everybody watching, please follow the work of Dr. Monica White and the entire crew, the entire sisterhood and so many others who are, are making contribution here um, by the book, Pig in the Garden, look up that article as well. Uh, somebody said, make the list, send the list. The list is out there, y'all. People have done wonderful work in the ways of putting this in these uh, uh, curriculum and lists and kind of reading lists and stuff like that. But we'll also put that out there again as well. Dr. Monica White, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you. I got a hunch we're going to be together soon again, yeah. uh, maybe yeah. a week or so. <laughs> but <laughs> I really appreciate you. I appreciate you so much and the work you're doing. Thank you, Baba. Thank you. Everybody watching, thank y'all. Y'all love on my sister. Y'all love on all of the crew who's doing this work. I pray that this has been a blessing to you and I pray that it's put some some uh, some wind to the sails of your own understanding of organizing activism. I pray that you find your tribe, your crew, your circle. I love what Dr. Monica White said. I've used the term self-determination for so long, but something has always kind of felt a little off about it. I love being intentional now through Dr. White mm -hmm. teaching me again uh, about putting community in front of that. And, and being intentional about naming that so we're clear uh, about what it means. But find your tr your crew and your tribe uh, as you march in and as you move in and as you're demonstrating in public and in private ways. I pray that this this interview has been uh, some some good nourishment for your journey wherever you are. Thank you so much. Y'all have a great night. God bless y'all. Until next time. Next Sunday, we're going to do it again. 6 p.m. I'm working on something big, y'all. <laughs> listen, I promise you that next well, week. You got me laughing. For you. I'm going to have something for you. So come and join us next Sunday. Tell everybody. Somebody. Come into the living room. We're going to have some good here. chat and conversation. God bless y'all. Have a good night. Are we done?